Well, for, for anyone who might be living under a rock and doesn't know, yes. there was an attempted assassination against uh, President Donald Trump. Um, he was at a rally in Pennsylvania. Yes. He was speaking. At the last split second, he turned his head to the right, and the assassin's bullet went by and it struck his right ear. Had he been just inches to the left, it probably would have killed him. Um, I'm going to stop you right here. Mm-hmm. Do you think civil war would start it? If he got killed that Saturday, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, of course, my phone started blowing up mm-hmm. uh, as soon as this happened, and a lot of people were asking that question. Um, former colleagues of mine in the government, law enforcement, etc. Everybody started talking, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into that in a minute. But I certainly think that God's hand was over that situation because it wasn't even so much about Donald Trump as an individual. But it was about America, because had he been killed, I think this country would have erupted. Now, I don't know how that would have looked. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a physical or kinetic issue, but it certainly would have launched us into chaos because no one trusts the government or its institutions at this point. And because of that and the gross negligence of the Secret Service in this incident, which we can talk about, yeah. Um, it certainly would have just, I think the country would have exploded. And I'm hesitant to say exactly how, because I don't know. But I think that the fact that he quickly stood up, um, as we all observed, raised his fist, you know, to let everyone know he was okay, I think that was, uh, that was a miracle. And that photo is iconic right away. Uh, it'll live in history forever. But you know what's crazy? <clears throat> that there was an assassination attempt and nothing happened. No riots, like nothing. We don't do that. That's the Democrats. <laughs> they would burn the country down of course. right away. Yeah. Well, as you, as you know, right, globally and from history, we know that leftism and its movements uh, always arise through violence. We know that with Stalin. We know that with Mao and what he said. Lenin. It definitely. comes from the, 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 the barrel of a gun, right? Uh, that's not our way of doing things. Now, we can be pushed to the brink of action. We've seen that before. We've seen that um, if you go all the way back to the American Revolution. But it took quite a bit to get there. We're a little bit more patient, calculated, and we want to do the right thing. Where the left is motivated by emotions and hatred and rhetoric. I think that's a great point to kick off the discussion on Trump because first let's set the tone here. The amount of violent rhetoric against Donald Trump for, for years now, several years, has been so high, it's amazing to me to hear the Democrats trying to excuse themselves from that, you know? Uh, I just was uh, on the way over here, actually. I want to bring it up so I don't misquote it. But this was just not too long ago. President Biden himself uh, tweeted, and uh, this was on uh, June 28th. Donald Trump is a genuine threat to this nation, Joe Biden tweeted this. He's a threat to our freedom. He's a threat to our democracy. He's literally a threat to everything America stands for, Joe Biden. And that was viewed 13 million times on X. Him, and we could go on and on and on, thank you, about um, the mainstream media and uh, Democrat politicians and Nancy Pelosi and on and on and on. I just watched a video montage of all these... Uh, media folks and politicians saying he's Hitler, he's literally. evil, he's literally going to destroy democracy. And it's like, what do you think is going to happen? You know, somewhere out there in this country of hundreds of millions of people, someone is going to take your word and believe you Yes. that, oh, well, if I let Trump get elected again, uh, we're all going to die and live in ghettos. And, you know, he's like the real fascist Hitler again. Absolutely chaotic that then uh, it's hypocritical that in the days after this attempted assassination, you see all these people coming on and paying, you know, lip service and everyone needs to calm down and be kind. And not one of them, though, included themselves, right? That was what I was disappointed when Joe Biden finally, I mean, it was past his bedtime, but when he did, (laughs) he did come on and say something. He, um, he, He talked about how everyone needs to tone down their rhetoric, including the conservatives. And I thought, you should have said, and me. Because just moments before this happened, 
Biden's also the guy that said, you know, we need to put him in the in the crosshairs or whatever. Bullseye. Whatever. Bullseye. Yeah. So, you know, they 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 have a pattern of inciting violence, and, uh, and all they do is they turn it around and they blame you for doing exactly what they're doing. And they were uh, doing those uh, things on the stage, like just mocking, killing uh, Trump. That, yeah. Th- it's all documented. You have comedians holding his bloody head up. Yes. You have um, Snoop Dogg making a music video where he shoots Trump in the head. You have all these actors like Madonna saying she thinks about blowing up the White House. Or um, you have, uh, what's his name, Johnny Depp, who said, you know, when was the last time an actor killed a president or something? I mean, there's so many, it's, it's hard to count how many of them have called for violence against conservatives. And then, it's not just words. You mentioned burning cities down and rioting. Well, I, I was working for the government still in, in 2020 during the insanity of the BLM years. They burned half this country to the ground, murdered people, destroyed businesses, attacked police officers, all over lies, which now we know none of it was even true. Um, so it's it's amazing. You wanna you wanna hear the crazy story? So Lithuania is far, far away from the US. Like I told you, a small country, right? Yeah. 99.9 population of Lithuania are whites. We have never had slaves. We have never had a lot of immigrants, like nothing. In 2020, there were riots in our capital as well. So there were youth going through in our <clears> capital, <throat> holding the, this thing, and they were, there was written, fuck the police in English. Fuck the police. Great. Like, why? Mm. What kind of police do you want to fuck with? If I, if I smack you, who are you gonna call? What, what do you have in common? BLM in the US and fuck the police in Lithuania? They have no idea what they were doing, Mm-mm. like no idea. Well, that's why what the left is doing is more dangerous than a physical movement because it's ideological yes. and it, it doesn't know borders. It's a globalist perspective. It's like what the World Economic Forum is pushing. They don't want people to identify by nationality or country because it diminishes the power that they can hold. Why, why try to be in control of one country when you can try to rule the world? That's the new world order that they're trying to go for. And these ideologies, you see, that's a perfect example of how infectious the mind virus is, that something that, that these, these young people don't know anything about that happened way far away in a different country, that's not even true but it's motivating them to take physical action. That's Mm -hmm. unbelievable. I think we should state for clarity, by the way, that uh, nothing that they said about George Floyd was true, nothing. The officer holding him down had nothing to do with killing him. He did not suffocate him. Uh, The evidence and forensic evidence showed that he died of a fentanyl overdose. And that's a fact. Those are facts. It's it's a fact. And they sacrificed this guy, this police officer, to, to, the, to the, the demigods of leftism. They knew that he was innocent and they put him in jail because they were more afraid of the mobs rioting and burning the city than they were about telling the truth. That's how you know the left are cowards. And the guy was stabbed, I wanna say, multiple times, right? Oh Dozens yeah, they tried to kill him in prison, in prison. just recently. Mm-hmm. So Ju- uh, July 13th, what do we know so far? So when I watched this tape, I was like, why are the sounds of uh, the shots are so so silent, I want to say. It's like the airsoft. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there's an explanation. I'll, 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 I'll cover that up because we do now, we now know that there was, a, there was a, a, an AR-style rifle. It's, the round is a 5.56, which yes. is a very common NATO round, right? Um, but you have to understand that the way microphones work at those rallies, they're condenser mics, right? It's the same reason why if I, right now we're talking on here and my voice is gonna get picked up, but you're not gonna hear a lot of ambient noise because there's a threshold limit. Yes. So he had a rifle, that's for sure, because we have you know, a hero in the crowd covering his family who was shot in the head. We know what type of round it was. He's passed away. We recovered the rifle. So we know what kind of bullet it is. The audio can be deceiving, just like video can be deceiving. You have to be very careful what you see on the internet and on the news about being too quick to jump to, well, what does that mean? Um, because that, that doesn't, that's not an indicator of anything. What, what, what we know is that, there, there, I'm, I'm not excusing it, I'm saying there's gross negligence in how he was able to get those shots off in the first place. But he definitely had a rifle. Um, so I guess after this incident, right, the, the guy was quickly identified 
um, Thomas Crooks is his name, 20 years old, 20 years old. Um, from Bethel, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour from where the venue was. And slowly over the next few days, this, this, this picture of gross incompetence has come out on behalf of the Secret Service and really local law enforcement. Now, I should say for anyone listening, before I give my opinions here, I've been working you know, high threat protective missions for like 20 years. Right? I, from the very beginning in 2005, when I was in Iraq as an active duty army guy, uh, I was running protective convoy missions for the State Department. So I've been doing this for a long time, and I've done it in a pretty wide variety of places. Some of the most austere, violent war zone places in the world, all the way to domestic operations. And I've worked a, a wide range of people from foreign government people to you know Secretary of State of the United States um, to diplomats going to different places in, in war zones in Iraq. Um, what I observed, because I've planned events like this before, mm -hmm. not, not for a, a president, but for different protectees, uh, VIPs, um, there was a lot that went wrong. So for starters, one, the Secret Service now has come out and said that the building that the shooter was on top of, right? There's, there's two <laughs> issues there. One, they said, well, we didn't cover the top because the roof is sloped, okay? Which, which makes absolutely no sense. That to me, that's that's the lady that uh, Cheadle. She's the director of the Secret Service right now. She, that before, just prior to that, she worked for uh, PepsiCo. Well, she she jumped back and forth. So she retired from the Secret Service, and then she went to Pepsi, and then Jill Biden was a big push in getting a woman to lead the DEI. DEI push to get a woman to lead the Secret Service. So right off the bat, I can tell you that she's not there because she earned it or because she was the most competent for the job. She was there because she met the qualification of DEI hiring procedures. That's the first problem. Two, her comment uh, back to the sloped roof thing is nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, that's not in any professional training or, or perspective that you'll find anywhere in the world. It's nonsense, right? Uh, the second thing that came out is the building was occupied by local police. They were inside the building underneath where the shooter was. Um, I think that that's like Cheadle and the Secret Service trying to deflect their mistake. She's, she's trying to say, as they release little bits of information, because they're not being very transparent or honest, but they're giving us little pieces on the news that you see. And to me, that's just an excuse. That's like saying, oh, well, that wasn't our area. You know, she's, it's very self-righteous. So she, she came out and said, oh, it is, you know, I am in charge. It is the service's fault. But... You know, that's not how someone apologizes, right? If you're going to you just resign. If you, exactly, you should resign. And when when she was asked, "Are you going to resign?" she said, "No." So, the police are underneath the roof. Perhaps most disturbing is this uh as someone on uh X made a great montage. They they put the videos, they put all the cell phone videos of people when they see the shooter like climbing up. Someone on the internet put them all together and they put a timer on the bottom, a clock. Yes. And it shows how long it was in real time between when the first person saw the suspect, the shooter, until when someone responded. And that is a, is, that's hard for me to watch because one of the first things you do when you're planning a, really any kind of operation, it could be a, a search warrant or um, you know, a, 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 a drug operation or something, and certainly with protective missions, one of the first things you plan is your communication. That's discussed, and everyone knows it. You usually have primary, secondary, and tertiary comm plans. That's at least that's that's your backups, right? Redundancy is perfection. So, you have your primary maybe your radios. That's our number one way of talking. Secondary could be a cell phone or an InstaTalk feature, but you always have at least three um, communication uh, channels. Correct. Um, and, and obviously, if you're working with a different agency or organization like police and you have a different agency with Secret Service, then part of the planning is to make sure that everyone can talk to each other. So I, I cannot figure out watching those videos how it's possible that that information did not get to the Secret Service uh, and, and no one responded. It's just it blows my mind how incompetent that process was. If you have people 
One of the guys I interviewed looked like he'd been partying all day. He has a beer in his hand and a koozie. <laughs> and he's like, I saw the guy get up on the roof. And he's yelling, there's yeah, a guy yeah. with a gun. Okay. So eventually someone notices, but not before he gets shots off. Now information that just came out recently that one of the police officers climbs up the roof behind him, sees him, and the guy points the gun at him. And so he runs away. Now, this is... You know, it, this is within all of this happens within seconds, so it's it's very fast, okay? But he did back off, and in the next seconds after he backs off, he gets you know a bunch of uh, shots off toward uh, the stage where President Trump is speaking. Um, one of them, obviously, probably the first shot it looks like on video, hits him in the ear, and then Trump ducks, and then there's more rounds fired, and of course, um, the fire chief is killed. And one other or two other people are critically injured. Yes. I haven't heard uh, their names or identities. Okay, so now this story is emerging of this total utter failure. You have local police that did not respond quickly or properly. You have a counter sniper team up on the roof. By the way, it's a sloped roof. <laughs> the one that the one that she said that you know that it was too dangerous to put people on. It's more sloped than the one the shooter was on. They're up there and they're looking the direction of where the shooter is. All right. Um, uh, so just utter incompetence uh, in the communication and response. The next problem I see as, as a professional in the protective industry is the immediate response to when the president is shot. So, look, when you go through training, protective training, and I've been through so many, I, I can't even remember them all. We, you know, I went through protective uh, training when I was in the army, still active. Then later I worked for a private military company and that's all we did is high threat protection and we did extensive training there. Later I was with the diplomatic security service. We protected more people than any agency in the world. So I've done this a lot. One of your sort of elementary lessons is how to react to fire, uh, reaction uh, to contact. Um, if you're in a military unit, React to content is, is, is very different than having someone to protect. Because if you're, go, if you're doing a direct action or you're counter assaulting or something like that, your movement is gonna be different. Now, when you have someone that you're protecting, they are the number one priority. And the, the number one priority with them is to get them out of the line of fire. So day one, when you're training or running scenarios on how to respond if, if, if your person is attacked is, the people nearest to them, the first thing you do is identify direction of fire, right? Contact right, contact left. Whoever has knowledge, you scream it as loud as you can so everyone else around you knows where the enemy is. And as soon as that happens, the people in that direction, they turn and face the threat and draw their weapons and everyone else on the other side of that diamond or stage left, depending on what type of situation you're in, they rush to the protectee and they move him immediately. You don't stand there, you don't talk with him. You you everything should be a beautiful dance. You 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 turn and move, engage the suspect, the others grab him and go, and it's all pre-coordinated. It's all planned. You, th this all should have been briefed, right? It, especially in a stage event. Stage events are are um, a pre-planned, like I said, like a dance. You know what direction your stash car is. You have a vehicle waiting, but you also in in the planning have determined, okay, um, for all the possible scenarios, right? What if the, the gunfire was coming from the direction of where the president's car was? Well, you plan for that, okay? Well, then we're gonna go the other way and I have a secondary stash car or maybe I have a building, well, a hardened structure that I can hide behind. All of these scenarios, you pre-visualize and you plan out in your head. That's how professionals do it. So the moment a, gun, a gunshot goes off, I, sometimes it takes you know your brain half a second yeah. to, to orient yourself what's happening. But as soon as people start saying "shooter right" or you know "shots on the right," whatever your 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 call out is, you immediately go into that. I know what to do because I've planned this. So, in in my opinion, when I look at their response and how they responded to me, it shows that a bunch of people that had not visualized their role. Uh, I'm sure it's not everybody because I don't know every one of those people on that stage, but it was pretty obvious the world is watching. You can hear because the, the mic is still hot, right? You can hear them saying, what are we doing? What are yes. we doing? That That's just like, 
I was so embarrassed to hear that. That should crazy. never come out of a professional protection operation uh, individual. That should never come out of their mouth. What are we doing? No, no, you should know what you're doing. You, you had an incident happen. This is not the first time you go through this. I'll also tell you that professionals visualize, right? You'll hear this from NFL players and pro you know, sports people in general. You visualize your actions. It's a big part of making you successful. Uh, same thing in the protection world. When you're out there, head on a swivel, constantly looking, you're not looking at your phone, talking with friends, you're visualizing in your head all day going up to that event. All right, what what am I gonna do right now if, if a, a bomb goes off right here? What am I gonna do if a sniper shoots? Where am I gonna go? Every step of the way, you're talking it through in your head. This is something I just did, um, we just did some classes with some of my guys at my company, and I, and I was telling them this, like you constantly need to visualize if you're walking somewhere, every step of the way, think if something happens right now, wh where am I going? Am I turning around? Am I running to that door? And then, you know, 20 feet later, uh, as you're walking, things are different. So what do I do if something happens now, you know? So that was the second big thing I noticed was just the utter sort of failure in, in their response, the physical response, all right? Then they get them out and here comes the investigation. Right. <laughs> and, and now it's like now we're finding out this other all these other elements where operationally they failed. Um, and I, I want to pause and, and note the, the big difference between professional protective operations and say like bodyguards that you see around like movie stars and things like that. There's a big difference is that bodyguards and security guards tend to be reactionary. They uh, respond when something happens first, and then they react. In professional protection operations, it's all about mitigation and intelligence. You stop things from ever happening in, the, in your methods, in the way that you do things, in, in the assets that you bring forth to use, right? This is where this becomes very incompetent. And this is what happens when DEI takes over your hiring process. Because instead of the professionals with the real world experience, they had a bunch of people that were hired because of their gender or because they were loyal to a political party, not because they were good at their job. And this is proof of that. So we, 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 the FBI has a cell phone, right? And they haven't seen anything, nothing. They don't, and I'm, I'm getting to something here that's very important. Nothing, they found find anything on his cell phone. They, um, they know that he made it through the magnetometer with a um, range finder. That's a device that you use to measure distance. It's, a, it's like a single bino, so they look differently, but he had a singer monocular that you look through like a scope and it tells you how far away things are. Why was he allowed to enter with that? That's, that's a big failure right there. He wanted to see Trump very close. He all, yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> he also had a transmitter which was an electronic device. Now I saw a picture of it, it's just a black square, right? A transmitter, which we now know, would have been used to set off explosives. They found an explosive device in his car, and they found another explosive device in his house, and he had the transmitter on him. So again, my question is, how does that escape scrutiny? I work much lower threat protective stuff uh, just here locally in Southern California. And we do not allow people to bring things that look like that. That would be a big red flag. When I brief my team or my guys do, I'm not always involved in it individually. Our teams are always briefed on what to look for. And it's and we constantly refresh. If you see this, you know, make sure you stop that. If you see somebody carrying a big bag into a building and they go through the detection thing, pay attention to what they're holding, et cetera. Again, this is like protection 101. Um, the other thing that came out recently was that the parents called the police the day before. That they were concerned, or I'm sorry, that day they called earlier in the day because they didn't know where their son went. Now, I'm sure we're going to find out more about that because in, 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 like in my professional opinion, that doesn't make any sense. There's got to be more to the story there. He's a 20 year old. He's 20 years old and he normally goes to work on Saturday. And he was not missing for a week. Right. So what, what, what was really their concern? Some, something made the dad call the police. Okay. Um, and you would think that somebody who's somewhat competent 
would realize, hmm, there's a, there's a big event with the president today in this area. Maybe I should pass that intel along. Sharing is caring, right? <laughs> so when you have information, it's, it's the whole like uh, see something, say something deal. So that failed as well. Um, so you have uh, just gross incompetence in the operational planning. The last thing I noticed in, in the operation itself was how is it possible that you allowed a threat to get up on top of a roof 150 yards away from where the president is, and there's nothing out there. It's like a big farm field in rural Pennsylvania, out in the middle of nowhere. The population of the city is 13,000 people, and you have a white roof that, <laughs> that's not hard to see somebody. You have a counter sniper team facing that direction, looking at the roof. And then my other question is, where's the surveillance? We use drones, yes. we use fixed wings, we use FLIR, forward-looking infrared, thermal, uh, lots of different options What was the, these days. the second one? FLIR? Yeah. Forward-looking infrared. That's infrared um, um, sight feature. FLIR is used, I'm sure you've seen it, where you, you've seen the cameras when they switch to like a black and yeah, white yeah. and it shows a, a, like a highlighted white glowing figure. That's, that's, that's FLIR, right. And then you have thermal, which can look different depending on what type of device is being used. We have all these options for surveillance and observation and counter surveillance. And this was a major, major fail. And the time frame between the first guy that saw him and the, sh uh, the shots were fired were 20 minutes. Is yeah. that correct? I don't, I don't know what the exact time was. I know that it's enough time to respond though, because when you're, when you're actively working a protective mission, five seconds, is enough time. How long does it take? If, if, if you and me are using radios, then distance doesn't matter. Yes. Right? Yeah, Just like they, a cell phone. They saw him climbing. Right. So, so if, if you're able to tell me, there's a guy with a gun getting on the roof. Okay. My, my immediate question, if, if I'm observing or able, I'm going to say where location, where yeah. is he? He's on this roof, right? Or whatever it is. The, the, the officer who saw him, he's got a radio too. So there was a total breakdown in communication. Now, Here's where I'm gonna I'm gonna delve into uh, conjecture. Okay, <laughs> this is my opinion. I don't have proof of this, but this is my opinion. In my opinion, I believe that this guy was prepped. I think that it was obviously planned. I think that it was planned for a long time, and I think he had help. And I know they're saying that he didn't, but I'll tell you why I think he does. Are you familiar with what I mean when I say tradecraft? No. So tradecraft is things that you, these are indicators of someone's profession. Oh, yeah, uh, I got you. Things, things that tell me as, as an observer, this guy's been trained or he has you know, some knowledge of this, right? And then if you go to the same schools or we learn the same, let's say we're both in the, in the military. Well, if you're doing something that we both learned in the military, I, I would, in my mind, I would think, hmm, I remember when we learned that. Right, so it would kind of tell me where you're from, or maybe we were both in the intelligence community and we learned something in a class, right? That that became tradecraft, and I, I, me observing it, I might recognize, hey, that looks familiar to me. It looks like tradecraft. Okay, why I bring this is why I bring that up. This kid is 20 years old. He has no experience at all. But let's look at what he planned. He's got explosive devices at his home, and in his car. He has a transmitter. Uh, to set them off remotely. Now, it didn't look like they went off. We don't really know what his plan was, but he had possession of those things. He obviously planned this event because he lives an hour away. So there was pre-planning. There was obviously some surveillance. We know there, there had to have been surveillance in the planning cycle because how did he know where to go? He, he drives an hour away. He knows what rooftop to get onto where he would have a clear line of sight. He bought a ladder and he didn't end up using the ladder because he climbed up on top of an air conditioning unit. But in the planning, he bought a ladder. And he was a registered Republican. And to me, that right there tells me there's some tradecraft involved. Because that kid doesn't know how to do anything. To me, that's an indicator that a professional is behind him. Someone telling him how to remain quiet, how to stay off people's radar, making sure that he doesn't say anything on social media. That's all pro professional hallmarks. How to uh, deceive your, your potential enemy by maybe registering as a Republican, right? Uh, 
Now, why do I think that's a deception? Well, because in uh, 20, what year was it that's coming out? I'm gonna mess up the year. Three years prior, he uh, uh, made a donation when he was, he was 17, he made a donation to Act Blue, which is a radical left-wing super PAC. Uh, and their goal is to get Democrats, uh, very far left Democrats elected, right? People like Ocasio-Cortez and other loonies up there. So what happened to this kid? He makes a donation to an organization that wants to put far left-wing people into office, and then three years later, he's suddenly a Republican who's trying to kill Trump. I don't buy it. To me, that looks like tradecraft. It looks like someone trained him. They showed him how to use a rifle, which he doesn't know how. Information now came out that he tried for the rifle team in high school, and he got canceled. He was not accepted because he was so horrible. So in a couple years, how do you go from so horrible to shooting the president of the United States in the ear? That's how close he was to, to pulling it off. So to me, I see training. I see planning and training and someone who's wiser and smarter than him guiding him and saying, hey, do this, don't do this, etc." And I see there's an obvious intervention on the operational planning side. So somebody with tradecraft, somebody that knows what they're doing, helped this kid get up onto that roof, and I'm sure they are utterly disappointed when that bullet hit his ear instead of his head, because all that planning and, and time just went away. But it was supposed to hit his head just a split second. God's yeah. will. Absolutely. But can you imagine you being, no, no, not you, but a regular Joe being 20 year old, and you, you ought to do this, and you're not being afraid of doing that? What well, kind of drugs did they use? That's on another them? that's another indication of tradecraft, in my opinion, because he's the perfect target. Uh, if if you're going to go and conduct some kind of intelligence operation, and and uh, you're looking at people to to approach and use, there's a couple things that motivate people. Well, there's a lot of things that motivate people, but most commonly you have you have blackmail, you have money, power. Um, but one thing that motivates people is the idea that they can do something great, right? You, you take young, easy to impress people and tell them, you're a hero. Now think about him as a, as a, from a profiler perspective. He was bullied in school all the time. That's what his classmates are saying now. He failed at the rifle uh, team that he tried to join. Um, we don't see much of an identity or social scene for this young kid. So to me, it seems like a very impressionable young man who I could approach and say, your country needs you. You could be a hero and we're gonna make you a, a special you know, um, warrior. We, well, who knows what they said? We're gonna train you, we're gonna teach you, and we're gonna show you how to shoot a rifle. I, 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 like I, this is just my opinion. I don't have any proof of this, but to me it fits all of the marks of someone that could be used and motivated by illusions, you know, delusions of grandeur and then taught how to do these things. Now, I think to your point, you know, like, well, how do you get somebody to do this? Well, he messed up a lot. <laughs> that's, that's another thing to me that just reinforces what I'm saying because he didn't do it right. You know, the bombs didn't go off. He never used the ladder. He didn't kill his intended target, like all, and he got killed right away. So all of these things to me indicate a, a non-trained unprofessional who was just recently sort of prepped and guided to do this thing. Yeah, but Josiah, he hit him in, in the head. 150 feet the distance was, right? Yards. Yards. Uh, yeah. How hard it is to hit a target like a head well, from with a, this distance? Well, with a rifle, that's an easy shot. I mean, if you, if you go to boot camp, uh, basic training in the military, uh, you learn to hit targets out to 500 meters with no scope or sight, just iron sights. That's basic training for the military. And there's a reason why we use the 5.56 five, round. It's fast and it's, it's accurate and it's very easy to use. Remember the AR style rifle is a, is a gas operated rifle. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't have a large kick. It's very easy to pull the trigger semi-automatic pretty, pretty fast, right? The reason we don't use the 7.62 that's so popular in Eurasia is because the round is unpredictable. When it comes out of the barrel, it, it tends to tumble sometimes, mm, yes. depending on who makes the, 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 um, you know, the AK model. But the 556 is easy. You could give it to a kid and teach them how to use it, which is why we use it in basic training, right? Um, that is actually not as surprising to me because in, in my mind, that's very close. What's, what's more surprising is 
Why did he get so close? How is that possible? In fact, he's so close, it's it's shocking to me that he even missed. That's why I say God's hand intervened. Because I could take you right now with no training, I could go show you, and I guarantee you could hit a target 150 meters But he meters would not away. have missed if he wouldn't turn his head. Well, and that's why it's a miracle. That's why, obviously, that God was, a bullseye. Was, was protecting us. Yeah. It, like, not um, not even his head. He could have hit him in his body. Trump's not a small guy. He's he's a he's a big man. Yeah, but he's so, got his uh, bulletproof vest. Yeah. Well, you have you have you have a vest that he's wearing. Hopefully, he was wearing it. I haven't heard confirmation. I've of seen that, the photo but, which, with the <laughs> this side of his body and with the with the hole. So he. Uh, I saw that yeah. in the in the in his suit. He, yeah. He, yeah. I haven't heard confirmation if that's mm -hmm. if that's a real okay. bullet hole or not. It looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a miracle that he missed. It really is. Explain me this. So the snipers that shot the killer, they waited for a split second. So once they heard the shots, they shot him. So they had him on the target. Isn't that correct? Well, that's what that's what you would assume watching it from the outside. I don't know if that guy was like trying to find him if he didn't know where it was. And then when he shoots, he's like, oh, he's right there. Um, I did a... I did a recap, a special recap of the attempt on, uh, I threw it up on YouTube right after it happened. And I, I did mention that I thought it was interesting that the counter sniper comes off site for a moment after he shoots. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not something that you're taught to do. So you're, you're taught to follow through. You stay on scope, stay on site, and you, know, you barely release your finger. Uh, the idea is you stay on target. And what I noticed after he fires is he kind of like, he jumps, he, he looks up over his sight. That was odd. I, I don't know if that was like his heart rate was pounding or, you know, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. I don't know. What I think is is unbelievable is that you have a team there looking at the roof and this kid still manages to fire a bunch of shots after, right? It, it seems like they were just waiting for him to get a shot and then, then to take him. I know. To take him down. Yeah, it seems like it. Seems very odd. That's why I, I, I think that there, there's something on the inside of that where you have all this indication that this young man was, was trained or planned it, but then he doesn't, he doesn't have any experience to do that kind of thing. So it begs the question, like, how did he know how to do all that? And then on the inside, you have this weird pause where all the communication failed, no one responded, no one takes the guy off the roof or shoots him before. They wait. They gave him one chance, right? That's what it seems like. They gave him one chance to hit Trump in the head, and he failed. And then what, what happens next? They kill him, right? It's like the plan didn't work. It would, have, it would have gone off smooth if he would have hit Trump, killed him, because then they would have been there right away. Oh, we killed the guy. And then he's dead, which I'm sure he is not thinking. In his mind, I, we know, he's thinking that he's going to live. Because yeah, he, yeah, sure. he has equipment at his house. He had that transmitter still, right? He didn't finish what, in his mind, he didn't finish the job. He wasn't done yet. But you can see from the other side, it, it kind of looks like they're like, okay, you, you get one shot, and then we're going we're gonna to kill you. He didn't you. know he's a useful idiot. No. Mm -mm. So, I mean, again, all of this is conjecture. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to get to the bottom of these things. I mean... You have a Secret Service who's not very transparent and full of DEI hires. They're incompetent as it is. You have now DHS, Department of Homeland Security Inspector General, has launched an investigation into the Secret Service. And for those listening who I, may not familiar, but Inspector Generals or IGs within departments are the ones in charge of investigating your own people, right? So if, uh, if the... Department of Justice did something wrong, then there would be an inspector general, a special counsel appointed to investigate those people. Same thing with every agency. It's like an IAD to the police. Right. Internal affairs. So the first thing that my wife said when we he saw the, for the first time the footage, she was like, why women protect him? Women are much smaller than him. What the hell are they doing? Well, and we, and we got this photo when, when a special agent to woman, female, she just ducks. When she hears a shot, she's like ducking. That's not what you do, right? You protect with your body. You're willing to give your body, uh, your life for the person that you uh, give, give security. Yeah, so maybe, remember when I was talking about sort of basics of training? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I had mentioned what you do like when you're in a vehicle or how to react. Well, 
with um, if you're walking, let's say you're walking a diamond or a protective detail around a person. What you're taught is that you make yourself a large target. Yes. Right. You 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 square up and cover as much of the protectee as possible. Put your plates forward. The idea is to make yourself big so that you're protecting him. Right. So that's if you're indicating that 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 was a failure right there. Uh, obviously, the internet has just torn that poor lady up. I mean, they are destroying her. I mean, there's the so gun. many memes. And, <sighs> I mean, I feel bad for her because here's why I feel bad for her. Are the the Democrats? They lie to people all the time. It's the same way they lie to kids about transgender issues. They lie to them. They convince people that fantasy is reality. Mm -hmm. DEI does the same thing. They convince people you can do it. Yes. The only difference between you and a Navy SEAL <laughs> is is you know the color of your skin, the, it, the 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 gender. It's like no, that's a lie. That's a lie. There are standards of competence. So they lie to these people, and it's all fine as long as nothing happens. Yes. Right, we have the director uh, of the Secret Service, Cheadle. She was just on the news a couple weeks ago, saying, bragging about her goal of having thirty percent female uh, Secret Service. And so, my question is, what? Why are you even saying that? I thought your goal was to protect the president. Why is your goal to hire women or men or or whatever? See, DEI is utter communist nonsense, and and let's just call it what it is. It's communist. It's an equalizer of opponent's ability to react. DEI is designed to weaken people. Are you familiar with Cloward Piven? Cloward Piven was a husband wife back in the 1960s. Uh, they were communist and they believed that in their Cloward Piven strategy that if you overloaded a government program or agency so, so much that it broke, that it would then allow the government to come in and say, oh, it's okay, we'll take over. Yes. It's a method of seizing power that the communists use quite a bit. Now, Cloward Piven, they did it with the welfare system. They wanted to get all minorities in the country on welfare and break the system so that it failed and the only help people could run to would be the government. That's how you equalize everything and establish power. So DEI accomplishes the same thing. It's not about competence or uh, efficiency. It's about bringing people in of your same political ideology. It's the same reason Jill Biden pushed for Cheadle, this woman, to come back from Pepsi and lead the agency. It wasn't because she was good at her job or she was the best choice to protect our president. It's because she was a woman. I agree. My, my wife said the same thing right away. She saw it and she goes, this is ridiculous. Right? Now, it should be noted, by the way, that have you seen his detail now? No. They're all men. They're all dudes. Oh, what? The, uh, at the RNC? RNC. Yes. They've replaced it. Now, I want to clarify something uh, just so that, you know, you can't take snippets of what we're saying and manipulate it. I've worked with some very competent females, but the best people in any business know their limitations. Just like when I led a, a task force on an investigation or something, I knew my limits. So the best leaders know how to build teams. I would go find the people. If they're the best at that job, then I want you working with me so that your strength can help my weakness yes. and my strength can help your weakness. So there's nothing wrong with uh, knowing yourself. And, and there, are, there are some females that uh, you know, can totally decimate uh, a man. In, 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 you know, look, at, look at the CrossFit games, we'll show you that, right? But being- The UFC fighters. Yeah, UFC. Being realistic though, the percentage of people here is a very small percentage, right? So you're trying to tell me that there were five, I counted five females yes. on Trump's detail. You're telling me that those five slots outbeat or outperformed some former shooter operator dudes with 20 years of experience in high threat protective operations? No way, no way. We don't even have to guess. We know what they did because she came out and said it on the news. My goal is to have 30%, 30 women. So what she did is she did not put people on the detail because of competence. She did it because of ideology. And that's a dangerous, dangerous problem. We see this throughout uh, leftist groups uh, and, and really I say human secularist types governments all throughout history. Remember Saddam? Saddam made like the local shoemaker his like Department of Defense head, right? You see the same thing in North Korea. It's, it's, it's about ideological loyalty, not proficiency. Um, the Gulag Archipelago, the, the book by Stolzhenitsyn, it's a fantastic perspective of that because the Soviets did the same thing. It wasn't about competence or proficiency. That's why millions of people starved in Ukraine because 
they had scientists that were telling them uh, this isn't working, guys. <laughs> but it was against the regime and, and the government, and so those people got killed or thrown in prison. And then pretty soon, people learned like, oh, well, if I want to be the boss, I'm going to say uh, yes. You're the best. You know, <laughs> don't don't look at all these people dying. You're the best at what you do, and they get the job. So DEI is a is a more passive way of accomplishing the same thing. It, 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 your, your focus is not in doing a good job, in protecting people, in competence, it's purely political. And every time those people do that, people die. Every time. 